Mm-hmm. Hello, everybody. We are here today with a very special guest, and not just anyone. Um, my very own Archbishop, uh, Khajak Sarpazan, uh, His Eminence Khajak Barsim is with here with us today. Uh, very much looking forward to it. We ha- obviously had our festivities for the past couple of months, and we had to t- we had the chance to to schedule it here right here right now. So, Khajak Sarpazan, thank you very much for being with here us today. Thank you, thank you, Vartan, inviting to be part uh, of this conversation. My, Absolutely. My good wishes and blessings to you and to everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Khajak Sarpazan. Um, Obviously, we were speaking in English, so I want to speak in Armenian so that my own Armenian will be we will be amped up. I have a tremendous uh, teacher with uh, with me today. Um, His Eminence Khajak, um, my first question is to you: For how are you doing? I'm doing well. <laughs> it has been a quite uh, busy few weeks. You know, I was in uh, Jerusalem for the Armenian Christmas celebration in Bethlehem. In uh, Bethlehem, we celebrate on. Uh, January 18 and 19, uh, the whole day and night, uh, on the uh, exactly on the place where Jesus was born, uh, in the uh, Church of Nativity, uh, and uh, it, uh, there's an altar uh, on the place where Jesus was born. And every day, every morning, uh, there is a celebration of liturgy. You know, Greeks celebrate, and then the Armenians celebrate. So I was there for that celebration and then I came and then we had a a uh, one-week meeting. Uh, It's an international uh, theological dialogue between the Catholic and Oriental Orthodox churches. So in Rome, we had this dialogue and we had the opportunity also to uh, meet with the Pope, have uh, his blessings. And then also since last week was the uh, week of uh, Christian unity, at St. Paul's uh, Basilica in Rome, uh, there was an ecumenical service uh, presided uh, over by Pope uh, Francis. So we participated also uh, in that uh, ecumenical service, praying together. Beautiful. The first question that, that pops up in my mind, how does your schedule look like? Like, how would a regular week for Khajak Sarpazan look like? Can you, what what for impression could you give us? It's it's difficult, you know, uh, uh, to say. Uh, actually, in my capacity now as the pontifical legate of the Western Europe and representative of the Armenian Church to the Holy See, so I am holding two hats, as they say. Uh, uh, you know, again, I'm asked by the Catholicos organizing the uh, Armenian churches uh, in Portugal, in Spain in the Netherlands and also in Belgium, where there are now many Armenians, especially during this last 25 years, uh, new immigration uh, began coming from the Middle East because of the political situation there, and also from uh, Armenia or former Soviet republics. So like in Spain, there were only few Armenian uh, families, and now there are about 35, 40,000 Armenians living all over Spain. And two weeks ago, I was in Barcelona, and then I was uh, also visiting uh, another community uh, uh, in Spain, where, again, I consecrated a new church. So, uh, you know, I'm uh, also on weekends visiting different communities, you know, organizing uh, uh, and also celebrating liturgy, meeting with the people. And also with regard to uh, Vatican, you know, I participate meetings, uh, creating uh, connections so that again, the relationship between the Armenian and also Catholic Church becomes deeper and deeper. And not only with the Catholic Church, also with uh, other Orthodox churches and other Christian denominations, Uh, Armenian Church for many centuries has been very ecumenical. Actually, uh, you know, this past year we celebrated 850th anniversary of St. Nerses Shnorali. He was the Catholicos and the Patriarch of the Armenian Church during 12th century. You know, he was a great theologian. He was a great uh, 
a poet. He wrote many, many hymns, which we are using uh, in our uh, church services today. Uh, and then uh, he was a humanist and he was a great ecumenist. Uh, you know, what he said, what he wrote, what he did during 12th century, incredible because ecumenical movement uh, started during last century. Uh, it was the middle of last century when the World Council of Churches uh, founded. And from there, uh, you know, ecumenical movement began before the churches were fighting with each other. And now, thanks God, with the ecumenical spirit, the ecumenical movement, there is conversation, dialogue, meeting, understanding, uh, you know, each other, and especially on uh, certain issues, moral issues, on uh, uh, certain social issues, you know, working together, cooperating with each other. But then an Armenian Catholicos, you know, starting a movement, 12th century, what he wrote, it's amazing when you read, you know, his spirit of ecumenism uh, is amazing. Uh, so Armenian church has been very ecumenical throughout the centuries. Beautiful. Uh, on that last point, um, slightly off topic, my apologies for everybody. I have great news. Uh, Ter Tarun, my priest, and you obviously know him, two or three weeks ago, he sent me a, a document of uh, a way for, for young people to register for Pro Oriente in Vienna next coming March, where Oriental Orthodox and Eastern Orthodox, where 20 young people will come there. Uh, all the accommodations will be will be will be done already, and I just received the email that I am selected. So I will be one of the twenty people who will represent the Armenian Church. So I'm very happy to to say that I will also partaking of the ecumenical movement so that the Armenian and the other uh, Apostolic Churches unify uh, throughout the future. So wanted to put that out there. Yeah, I am very happy to hear that uh, Daron told me about it, and I'm very happy, especially that you will be participating uh, because you uh, are the best person to represent the Armenian church in the ecumenical movement. That Pre Oriente uh, has been uh, for many, many years, has been uh, in some way uh, supporting the relationship of the Orthodox, Oriental Orthodox churches uh, and uh, the Catholic church. Uh, their uh, ministry, their mission has been a very, very, uh, important in the ecumenical movement yeah if, if, that, if i'm the person i'm not certain but i'm more than willingly want to participate in it so i'm going to let it all um happen thank you very much much it means a lot that, that you say that to me um the the direction i want to go now is a bit more towards your background um what i have here i have here your own wikipedia page <laughs> So mm -hmm. I want to really want to emphasize the people who are listening, who you are, um, what it is that you do, what you do, why it is so important that you do. So to give an impression uh, how you have been living your life on this planet. Uh, Khajak Bar Barsamya was born in Arabkir, Turkey in 1951. At age 13, he began his religious studies at the Holy Cross Armenian Seminary in Istanbul. Encouraged by Archbishop Shnor Kalustian, the late Armenian Patriarchate of Constantinople, he went to Jerusalem to study at the Seminary of the St. James Armenian Patriarchate from 1967 to 71. He was ordained a celibate priest in 1971 and achieved the ecclesiastical degree of Vartape two years later. His later educational pursuits led him throughout the United States and Europe to New York's General Theological Seminary, St. John University in Minneapolis, the Gregorian University in Rome, and Oxford's Oriental Institute. He has lectured in the United States, Italy, England, Germany, Jerusalem, and Armenia, and has conducted research at the Manuscript Library of Yerevan, the Mikitarist Institute of Venice, and the Manuscript Library of, at the Patriarchate of Jerusalem. His publications have appeared in various educational and scholarly journals in October 1991, a General Theological Seminary awarded him honorary Doctor of Divinity degree. So that is just a part of of your educational background. So a lot of people think that they are well studied, but there is a interesting level where you have been going. So my 
Father, my first question is, um, and also a lot of sisters and brothers wanted to ask this, what moved you from a young age to pursue this, uh, this bishopric? What moved you? What was your motivation behind it? Well, this is a question uh, when I was the Archbishop Primate in the United States. Uh, uh, every summer there we had many, many uh, uh, you know, uh, activities for young people. We, ha uh, you know, we have uh, summer programs, summer camps. There are two summer camps uh, with three sessions and also at St. Nurses Armenian Theological Seminary, uh, which is in New York City, a little bit outside of New York City during summer for college students, for high school students, uh, there are a special, uh, you know, 10 day sessions where they study their faith, Bible study, uh, and then the, the Armenian history. And, you know, I used to uh, visit uh, all these uh, youth activities and sit with young people and have a conversation. Uh, and they used to ask many kinds of, you know, questions. And one of the questions has been, you know, how you became uh, a priest, what moved you? And my uh, answer is that, uh, you know, my mother who passed away, my parents, uh, she used to tell me that when I was a child, I was born in Arabkin, as you said, which is a, a town or the city in the middle of Anatolia, uh, where there were seven Armenian churches, but during the Armenian genocide, those seven churches were destroyed. Uh, so, there was no church in Arabkir. But, uh, you know, again, I say my grandmother, who was a genocide survivor, uh, she taught uh, uh, my brother my, and my, uh, me, and then my sister was born, uh, the prayers, uh, and then Bible sto uh, stories. So there was a church at home. But my mother used to tell that when I was like two, three years old, three years old, uh, I used to imitate priests, like take the uh, table cover uh, uh, and then put, you know, like a, a shurchar and imitate the priest. Uh, so it seems from the childhood there was that, you know, calling in me. And then when we moved to Istanbul, I was six years old. Uh, immediately I started going to the local Armenian church because uh, in traditionally, uh, in every community, there is an Armenian church, and next to the church, there is an Armenian school. So in Istanbul, uh, where we were living, Gedik Pasha, it's called that uh, you know region, uh, there were lots of Armenians, so there was a church and there was a school. So every morning, there was a morning service. So at 7.30, you know, I run uh, to participate in the morning service, and then at 8.30, when the morning service finished, I ran uh, to the uh, school uh, and I was very fortunate, not only my grandmother, my parents who were great role models, but also the pastor of the church. And then, as you mentioned, Shunor Petriar, uh, who was a great spiritual figure and he is the one who saved many, many Armenians from the uh, interiors of Turkey. He brought these Armenians who were uh, you know, changed their names. They were not even baptized. He brought them to Istanbul. He baptized them. He uh, married them according to our church tradition. He gave them, he found them work, houses, and etc. So he became an inspiration for me. And again, I am grateful that throughout many years, I met Armenian and non-Armenian uh, clergy and lay people uh, who have been, uh, who have become very inspirational for me. So I have been a priest since 1971, as you said, uh, and this has been a uh, very fulfilling journey. Like in any journey in our lives, we have ups and downs. Like myself, we had up, well, my, I had also ups and downs, but overall, when I look back, I say, thank God uh, that I have chosen uh, you know, this way, serving, uh, you know, people, uh, serving our Lord, Jesus Christ. Very fulfilling. I, I don't, I don't hear you. <laughs> I muted myself. 
<laughs> my my apologies. Sorry. Thank you, Father. Uh, thank thank God, obviously, for that He has put that motivation in your heart, and thank you very much for the efforts you have done. God knows what type of ripple effect that has uh, in into people's hearts. So that your efforts may be eternal, and that every every person that sees your effort and understands what you do, what you, why you do what you do, that they feel motivated as well. Um, so you already mentioned before that there were um, ups and downs. Obviously, what would be a down? What is what would be what is like a a not so fun parts of of uh, your work like uh, in every le leadership i mean you try to do your best you whatever you organize whatever uh, you know you try to put together you do it for the best of the community of the people of the parish uh, but then sometimes people they misunderstand uh, and then uh, they start so-called uh, fighting <laughs> against what you know you want to do so it's a struggle uh, but then uh, throughout centuries i have uh, throughout you know years i have also learned that it's important that if i have an idea then you know i share that idea uh, and try to create alignment so that uh, it doesn't become my idea it becomes everyone's people feel ownership so it's a learning process. We all learn every day. Uh, so this is something I have learned that sometimes you have a good intention, you want to implement that intention, but then if people are not supporting, then it's you know upsetting. Uh, but then I have learned that it's important uh, in leadership, in every leadership, in uh, religious, in political, in community leadership, it's very important uh, that you know you. Uh, share your thought, your idea, your vision with others, and you are also open to hear their input. Because sometimes, and I have learned this, and I have experienced that, you know, I say something uh, on the table, put on the table, and then Vartan, you say that, Sir Pazan, maybe if we do this way, it will be better. And then I think, I say, it's a great idea, so I am open to accept. And then at the end, then there is alignment, and this is the leadership. And when uh, we speak about the leadership, I always give the example of Saint Gregory the Illuminator. As we know, uh, you know, when he baptized the King of Armenia and the Queen of Armenia, 301, and Armenia became okay. <laughs> <laughs> Armenia became the first Christian nation in the world, and then the historian says that he saw a vision one day in his vision our lord jesus christ a hammer in his hand came down from the heavens and start knocking the grounds and then lights came up and then they formed a cathedral so when he woke up he called the entire armenian people saying come let us build the altar of the light and again historian tells that the king the queen uh, everyone, uh, you know, male, female, uh, peasants, uh, uh, princes, they all participated in building the cathedral. And this is the leadership. You have a vision, you have a goal, but then you make that goal the vision of the entire community or majority. People, they feel the ownership of it. This is the best way of the leadership in every aspect. Exactly. So the, the head needs the body and the body needs needs the head <laughs> as a unity. I, I, I can Im imagine that, that that it is a struggle. But uh, we, in Armenian, obviously, you know, like just a, a fun story. Like my father, when I was a kid, uh, he says in Armenian to me, Araho <laughs> Like, you know what it like in simply simply translated, it means uh, uh, are you are you someone who doesn't have a head do you not have a mm -hmm. headship over you and it is very important to have a head over you mm -hmm. like in the modern western world right now everybody's like i am my own boss i have no boss over me it's that that type of spirit but to function as a church as a society as you mentioned before there needs to be alignment so it's a very 
very insightful thing you said, Father. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, like uh, you know, when Saint Paul speaks about the church, you know, yeah, says that you know it's like a body. Uh, the head of the body is the Jesus, but then you know we are parts of the body, and each part is important. You know, I cannot say that my finger is more important than my ear, and then in order to body uh, be stay you know healthy, uh, you know. The body, it's alignment. They, they co cooperate. They communicate with each other. Absolutely, my Father. My um, my question is going towards the future of our Armenian Church, together with the, the other apostolic faith. Um, what, what do you hope for that that will be uh, updated? It will be become better. What do you hope for our church going through the future? Well, uh, for me, again, based on my many years education or experience, uh, the most important thing is to have a well-trained and very dedicated clergy. Uh, because, you know, you can have the best, you know, ideas, the best plans on a diocesan level, or let's say even H. Miyazin, the center of our uh, church, might have great ideas, great plans, great publications, but then it is implemented on a parish level. And also, it's very important to have enough clergy. You know, today we don't have enough clergy. Uh, you know, if uh, we make the calculation, I would say we have about only 1,000 clergy, maybe all over the Armenian world, Armenia and then the entire diaspora. That's not enough. Before, genocide and before the Sovietization of Armenia, we had 6,000 clergy, 6,000 clergy. And uh, during genocide, about 4,000 were, uh, you know, massacred. And then Soviets, they took about 2,000 to the Siberias. So there was a vacuum. And during this time, uh, some people who knew some liturgical songs or whatever, not they were not trained well. Uh, they were, you know, they were ordained priests. So fortunately, today uh, the seminaries uh, they have much, much better uh, developed uh, projects and plans, so that uh, the clergy are being prepared. But then we need more clergy. And then uh, again, I always say that in every parish, in every community, uh, we have to encourage that young people, uh, they respond the call. I say, like in Europe or in the United States, you shouldn't wait clergy coming from Armenia. It's good that they are coming. But then, you know, also, you know, uh, people like, let's say, in Amsterdam, uh, and I am sure there are, you know, young people, uh, you know, who might have the calling. So we have to encourage them uh, to respond that calling and help them, uh, you know, how to, you know, respond that call. Uh, so we have to change the, this uh, mental thing. And also the families, like, you know, again, I could have been a medical doctor and this is what I wanted also to do if I was not a uh, priest or then priest. But then this has been very fulfilling what I am doing, you know, uh, serving people, you know, doing things for the community, doing things for our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, this is very fulfilling. And the question is, you know, what do we want to do in our lives? What is my goal? If my goal is to make 5 million euro, okay, 10 million euro, it's good. But is that the goal? Is, is it the intent? Will that bring fulfill, fulfillment? I don't think so. That can be a pathway. That's, that shouldn't be a goal. That can help to achieve what I want to achieve. You know, I remember after 9-11, I was in New York City. It was, you know, def definitely terrible. You know, there were lots of Armenian young people who were in the Wall Street. And they were making good money because the markets were good at that time. Uh, and then after 9-11, one evening when we were sitting together, they said, Sir Bazan, 
before 9-11, you know, we were thinking to make our, you know, uh, uh, five uh, uh, million dollars to make it 10 million, 10 million. But now I, we realize that that should be our goal. That should not be our goal. You know, if, you know, my goal is to have a family, to give good education to my children, to help, uh, you know, my church or to do some beneficial work, then that's the goal. Money, so-called, helps to achieve that goal. So again, coming back to, you know, calling, I think we have to encourage young people to become priests. And especially, uh, it's very important, like in, in the Western world, in US, in uh, uh, Europe, to have clergy who were born or educated in Europe, in US, because they understand not only the language, but I understand the needs of the younger generation. Like in US now, uh, there are third, fourth generation Armenian Americans. And they are Americans. And I correct, sometime in Armenia they say, Odar Yergir Gabriel. They live in a foreign country. Vartan, you are a first generation or second generation? First generation. First generation. Is the Netherlands a foreign country for you? Yes. Foreign country? For, for me, it's a for yeah. Armenia is my 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 country. Yes. I live here twenty five years. So. Okay, but then uh, your grandchildren, God willing, if they live in uh, the Netherlands, you know their psychology, their thinking will be, you know, uh, Dutch, and. And this is the experience in U.S. So they they are Americans the way they, the you know they think they act, but then also there are many many Armenian Americans. They are hundred percent Armenians. So there is no conflict being hundred percent Dutch, hundred percent Armenian. There is no conflict there. Just the contrary, you can become even much better human being and you can be even more helpful to Armenia. I know third, fourth generation Armenian Americans who are doing much more than so-called Armenians who were born in Armenia. And I can prove that. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, my, my, my question is that and this is not only for for Armenians per se, but but it, it could be used as as a case for now. Um, for me personally, it's very unfortunate, and I do not want to offend a couple of brothers and sisters of mine, but I do see Armenians going towards Protestantism or going to their own church, etc. That um, do you think that 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 type of modern way of thinking of their own way of of following Christianity uh, both is not the way how Christianity is, and both also is uh, at a disadvantage for the Armenians in a general. What are your thoughts on that types of movements in our in our ethnicity? Well, about several years ago in the United States, we had a, a psychological, uh, sociological study. As someone who is a professor, uh, you know, she did it. Uh, and the question is, uh, you know, how to engage uh, younger Ar Armenian Americans into the life of the Armenian church. Uh, and she reached out to different segments of the community, those who come to the church, those who don't come, those who used to come and they are not coming, those who come regularly, those who come, uh, you, know, you know, on feast days and etc. Uh, male, female, immigrants, uh, all, all, you know, different segments of the community. And then she put the title, Hidden Treasures of the Armenian Church. So our church is so spiritually rich, so spiritual. I, I, I spoke about Nurse Shunorali, Krikor Naregatsi, St. Gregory of Nareg, who was declared the doctor of the Catholic Church, and there are only a few doctors in the Catholic Church. His prayer book has been translated in many, many languages. And I can give many other languages. And also, theologically, Armenian Church is 
so balanced, so balanced. Like, you know, Armenian church fathers, they never say that outside of the Armenian church, there is no salvation. Their teaching is that this is the Orthodox faith, a faith which leads you to salvation. You have to learn about it. You have to teach and you have to live that faith. But then if someone believes in a different way, who am I to judge? God is the one who judges. Like abortion. It's an issue in the society. You know, Armenian church fathers, they don't speak about the, uh, you know, abortion. Their focus is life. That it is God's gift. So the strategy is developing the conscious of the individual. I mean, I can give many. I mean, there are so many beautiful things spiritually which enriches a person. So we have these treasures, but they are hidden. And that's why I said it's very important to have well-trained clergy, well-trained clergy, like, for example, I am very pleased, like their Daron has been able, and even their Mashtots in uh, Almolo has been able to bring many, many young people like yourself and having, you know, discussions, Bible studies, but before there was no, so it was their Daron, their Mashtots. So again, I think we have to encourage young people to go into priesthood and train them well, this is the only way. This is the only way. Why in the Netherlands or why in Belgium those people? Because every individual, even those who say, I am an atheist, because we are a being. We need food for our physical well-being. But then every person also has a spiritual need every person without discrimination so it's very important how to feed that spiritual need of a person an armenian church has the treasures but then again we have to find ways new ways to transfer to give that the spiritual wealth to an individual so that spiritually a person can be healthy Amen. Amen. I, I, I can I can subscribe to what you say at of the the hidden treasures of of not only our faith like our uh, Armenian ethnicity and our faith overlap on this particular point. To give a a quick background, um, up until my twenty first birthday, I'm twenty eight now by God's grace. Um, I started to rediscover it. I had general notions. I was very nominalist. But then like a catapult, it went the entire other direction. And my hope and my aim is in that in that same way, other people in general also have that same experience. So that their place in time and space and in history, that it has a meaning. My life has become a lot more meaningful when I've discovered all my, my own ethnic saints and my spiritual saints. I love... The other saints as well i love athanasius i love jerome etc they are my saints but at the same time i also have grigor lu savoric i have gregory of tatev at my at my uh, right next to me so my hope as like yourself is that the younger people will start to rediscover and fall in love again with with their faith and what the, what their history has to teach them it's very unfortunate it is but it's a, a gift and a blessing for us to do something about it. And I hope that God will use us mightily for that. And Vartan, have you taught being a priest? Uh, for now, no. So I, I want to say yes, but uh, we will see how God moves me to, throughout the future. There's a lot so, for me to do before. So my, I my suggestion is, you know, think about it. I will. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Most certainly, I will try to direct people towards that path. Most certainly. There, there is no other 
meaning in my life besides that besides uh, starting a family but that's all a different subject in of itself so but i will i will thank you Khajuk. my uh, another question this one is from my grandmother susan tati i will send uh, this clip to, uh, to her and i showed you already in the questions you mentioned before the Echmiatsin cathedral like the first cathedral in in the world one of our treasures physically speaking and also spiritually speaking why is it not open yet yeah well i mean it's a good question no no i appreciate the, the question uh you know again thanks god it was a miracle because uh, when you know a few years ago when the you know Vapar catholicos wanted to do some restoration uh the ones the experts uh, the you know the, those who came you know to the, the restoration they found that it's a very very dangerous situation you know god forbid mm -hmm. it, it could have been even collapsed because under h miyazin there is also water so uh, it was in a very very dangerous situation i mean uh, uh, if there was a, a small earthquake now maybe the whole thing would have you know collapsed so they started bringing you know different experts from europe from italy and then they started you know the you know renovation the, you know they changed the entire you know things again it's a long process and now uh, they are also re restoring the inside the wall uh, uh, frescoes because there were several frescoes one after so hopefully this june during the uh, feast of saint gregory there will be reconsecration of h Miazin. It was going to be done last year, but again, the frescoes were not ready. Uh, so, uh, you know, there is a, uh, you know, a 90% chance. Actually, we will have a meeting in H. Miazin in two weeks. And during that meeting, Supreme Spiritual Council, the date will finalize. And last time when we had, uh, they said the architects, the ones who are uh, in charge of the restoration, they said, uh, June will be already ready. Wow, Th that that's a different story. We we we, we regular people we think oh they are lazy they're, they're taking their time but it's actually very serious. No 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 they have been working day and night. I mean several times you know I went even inside I saw I mean uh, you know thank God uh, that it, it wasn't you know collapse it was very very dangerous situation very dangerous. And they needed, they had to open all the walls. They they need to put, you know, I, I don't know, I'm not an expert, but they brought the best, uh, uh, you know, experts from all over the world. Wow, well, that, that make that God may keep the Echmetzin Cathedral uh, uh, standing for all those centuries and millennia, for millennia, obviously. So, yeah, that clarifies a lot. Well, that's, that's also a symbol uh, of Christ's presence in in the life of the Armenian people uh, throughout the uh, centuries. And again, that has been our strength. I mean, you were talking about, again, the roots. You know, roots are very, very important. Roots are very important. Again, uh, you know, we are living a century where there is a, you know, overall uh, globalization movement. You know, I, 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 I am for, you know, I am personally a very international person. Uh, you know, I appreciate different cultures. I have, you know, close relationship with different people. Uh, so it's important, you know, uh, you know, creating that kind of connection with different uh, peoples, the different nations, different ethnic groups, and even different uh, faiths. Uh, but then it's very important to be faithful to your roots. Sometime in the globalization, and there is also danger in Armenia now what I see. And this is more dangerous than the political danger. You know, politically, you know, we were, you know, we had many ups and downs. But then we not only survive, but, you know, we continue also uh, bringing our uh, gifts to the world, to the societies where we were living. And wherever, you know, our forefathers went, they remain very faithful to their roots. Like they went to India 300 years ago. They became the bridge between Far East and Europe. But then what they did, 
you know, like three, maybe 30, 40 fa families, they be build churches, five churches in India. They build a school. Or, you know, like few families, they came to Amsterdam. What they did? They built a church. Only few families. So this shows that, you know, Armenians, they remain faithful to their roots. Even though they were in different cultures and, you know, they, you know, they were accepted in the you know countries where they were living because they contributed you know to the society where they were living but always remain faithful to their roots that means our faith our culture whatever you know as you mentioned so in this globalization movement it's very important to keep faith to be faithful to our roots when you are faithful to the to your roots then you are stronger psychologically spiritually you are stronger and then you are also open to the others when you are not sure of yourself then you create ghetto structure i can attest to that if you have no uh, saint paul says that that you need to be rooted in him if you have strong roots any kind any kind of storm can come but you will not break Amen. thank you on, on your last point i have here a question of uh two tremendous sisters arsine and uh, jana they're greeting you father they had a question my, my warm greetings to them too god bless them absolutely they 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 adore you so um their question is uh on on the per the point that you've mentioned before uh in what way has the Armenian church played a role or is playing a role in the political challenges of Armenia? Well, uh, again, I, I am a clergyman, you know, I serve the Armenian church, but again, I don't, you know, I serve the people. I serve the people. So when, uh, when I say I serve, I serve the people, then I serve also the country, Armenia. Again, I don't separate, even though, again, uh, there is a separation between church and the state, definitely, and there should be that separation. But then the, the church is the people, and I am the servant of the church. So I am the servant of the people. So, uh, again, my responsibility based on our faith, based on uh, the teachings of Christ also, to make sure that there is, uh, you know, justice. You know, uh, there is justice in the society, in the community. There is equality, and there is, you know, peace. Uh, you know, in the society, uh, and uh, for that, like, you know, I, again, sorry that I will give you know my own experience. You know, uh, when you know I was the primate in the United States. Uh, you know, uh, at that time, the president of Armenia, uh, uh, the first president of Armenia, uh, who is a scholar, who was, a, you know, a good friend of mine since we worked together in Madenataran when I was working on my doctorate. Uh, so he asked me to invite the first ambassador of Armenia to U.S. At that time, um, America did not accept Armenia's independence yet. So I sent the invitation that first ambassador came and the first embassy was at the Armenian Diocesan Center. And then all the ambassadors who came to Washington to uh, uh, also to New York, you know, we were working together. You know, I introduced them to the society and also I introduced them also politically, you know, to the people. So it was a partnership. It, it was a partnership for the benefit of the uh, good of Armenia. So this has been the role of the Armenian church throughout the centuries. <clears throat> yes, yeah, so, so church and state being somewhat separated, but also church and state working together. Yeah, as I said, when yeah. we say the church, church is the people. Sometime in the minds of the people, they think that, you know, the church is the Catholicos, the church is the Serpazan, the church is the Derai. 
Yes, we are part of the church. We are serving the church. We are servants of the church. So we are serving our people. People are the church. My question then is now, um, what are your thoughts that there is a bad connotation on the the Catholicos or the, the bishops like yourselves, unfortunately? That they they have the idea that there is a power grab or the, that type of spirit. Do you think it has to do something with the Soviet mentality that uh, our the, the the generation of my parents, for instance, are dealing with? Like, what are your thoughts on that whole aspect? Well, again, everyone is a human, and as humans, we are not perfect. Definitely, we are not perfect. But then. Again, uh, you know, God uh, gives us the opportunity to cleanse ourselves. So, you know, I am sure, you know, people, wh whoever they are, whatever they are, you know, uh, they are not perfect. But then uh, there are also rumors. In the leadership role, in the leadership role, there are people who might like you, who might dislike you for whatever reason. And then there are also rumors. For example, for me, you know, I, you know, if someone tells me about, you know, Vartan, you know, I, I just listen, but then I don't m make my mind about Vartan. I want to meet with Vartan. I want to have a relationship, conversation with Vartan. Then I make my mind. So sometimes people without proof, they, you know, make rumor and they spread that rumor and also sometimes there are also political reasons to create those rumors like if you want you know politically this is not new for centuries if you want to weaken a nation then you create division and armenian church and the armenian nation together has been very you know strong we're they were able to overcome all the challenges throughout the centuries. So there is also that side, creating division so that other powers or internal powers, they can achieve what they want to achieve. So what I'm saying is, again, also, also uh, it's very important that like I go to church not because Hajak uh, I go to church because I believe in our Lord Jesus Christ. And then if Hajak Sirbazan is not a good Sirbazan, then in our church is very democratic church. Then there are ways that Hajak Sirbazan is not responsible. Like in US, when I was the archbishop, every four years there is an election. Assembly, diocesan assembly, they elect or re-elect. And there are cases, like after me, there was a bishop who were, was not elected. So there are, there are systems also. If, you know, if someone is not doing, of, for example, if Taron is not doing a good job as a pastor, there is a parish council, there is a parish assembly. They can make a decision and they, they can come to Hajak Sirbazan saying that we are not happy with our pastor for the following reasons. And these things happened, like in America, where I was the private. So there is a system. Rather than creating all these rumors or these uh, gossips around it, because that's not helpful. That's not helpful. The one who is gossiping, that's not helpful also for the person who is being gossiped. Because that weakens the system. When the system is weakened, then you, myself, all of us, will feel uh, the effects. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, first of all, it's also a sign of maturity to first speak with someone, then let all the other noises be, be heard. And our Lord says, obviously, when a kingdom is divided against itself, it cannot stand. And that's also for the church. Obviously. And also we have to be courageous enough we have to be courageous enough to go and uh, face the person and ask the person that this is what I, I heard about you. Is it true? Yeah. 
Thank you, Father. My next question is, um, how, what are your relations of how have your relations been developing with the other patriarchs and bishops? Like I've seen uh, a picture, I've been Googling you, obviously. Um, I've seen some amazing pictures with you with the Pope, Pope Franciscus. I've been see seeing pictures with you with um, Bartholomew of Constantinople with the Eastern Orthodox Church. My question is, how has your relationship been with them? No, I, I mean, again, I have been, you know, very fortunate. I mean, knowing three popes, actually, uh, I made arrangements of Pope John Paul II, whom I was, you know, very close uh, to travel to Armenia, and also Pope Francis, and also Pope Benedict, you know, on several occasions. But then also I know Patriarch Bartholomew and also other Christian leaders. Uh, and also I had occasion also meeting with uh, the Russian Orthodox Patriarch, in Moscow, but when as a metropolitan, when he came to New York, I even hosted uh, a meeting inviting other religious leaders. Uh, so in my ministry, uh, you know, I created contacts with other you know church leaders, whether clergymen, bishops, cardinals, archbishops, with different denominations, uh, Orthodox, Catholic, uh, different. Protestant, uh, evangelical, uh, you know, and I have been, you know, engaged with the, uh, in the U.S. Uh, uh, the, uh, the Ecumenical Council in, in U.S., uh, National Council of Churches, you know, which uh, compromises many denominations like World Council of Churches. So uh, th this is part of my responsibility to creating connection. The, 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 then my question is um, a question of my father, for instance, when I told him that I would uh, have an interview with you, his primary question was, um, how can the Armenian church work together with the other churches despite the theological differences, et cetera, et cetera? So um, when there is, for instance, turmoil, um, how does our, our Christian identity transcends our ethnicity in certain sense? And it also applies to all the other apostolic faith and Christian beliefs. Then, uh, in so far, how do you see that the other churches could also help the Armenian church despite the fact that we are not in, co in communion in an official sense? No, no, in many ways, we cooperate. Like if there is a you know, like there was earthquake, for example, in Armenia, and uh, many churches, al almost all the churches, you know, they help, they reach out. Like we created uh, in many places, uh, you know, uh, fundraising or, uh, you know, uh, co collecting clothing or whatever, you know, they helped. Like, for example, or there is a disaster, uh, let's say in Haiti, you know, all the Christian churches, like in US when I was there, we collected money in our parishes and we sent through the National Council of Churches to those who are being affected in Haiti. So, uh, and then, uh, like, you, you know, if there is a political turmoil in some way, they make a statement, like for, you know, nagorno karabakh you know, National Council of Churches, World Council of Churches, they made a st statement or uh, Bishops' Conference of the Europe, uh, Catholic Bishops' Conference of Europe, European Union, they made, you know, announcements. So uh, on social issues, on some uh, issues, you know, we cooperate together. And then there are also prayer services together. And it's very important Beautiful. that there is this, you know, respect, there is this uh, communication. And then also like, you know, in our uh, theological dialogue, for example, with the Catholic Church, you know, now, like before they used to call us, a monophysite church, namely a church which only believes in the one nature of Christ. Now, when during the dialogue, when they uh, read our uh, church fathers, when they uh, interpret our Sharagans hymns, they see that we, we don't we believe in two natures of Christ, <laughs> not one nature. But then again, the expression, the interpret, how you present that, uh, you know, the language. Beautiful. That, 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 that gives me very much hope to hear that 
uh, despite those minute details of dia visitim is a mere visitim, all that type of stuff, still above that, um, the churches are still working together. And I was not that aware of how the system internally cooperates. So it's beautiful to hear. Thank you very much. Like, and also on a, a parish level, now, you know, some Armenians, you know, they uh, marry with Catholics or they marry with evangelicals. Uh, and again, uh, and sometimes the wedding is, is, is in a Catholic church, for example. Then, and again, the pastor of the Armenian church goes and participates in that service and vice versa. So there are also local events uh, or local, like, you know, locally, if the community has an issue overall, the society, then the churches come together and they make a statement or they take an action on a local level, not only international level. And there are many examples. Beautiful. I think and also sometimes interfaith, like, you know, several years back when uh, some Coptic Orthodox, they became martyrs. You might remember in, uh, you know, in the North Africa. Uh, the 21 uh, martyrs. Yeah. yeah, 21 martyrs. Like in New York City, in the Coptic Orthodox Church, the Cardinal of New York, who is a good friend of mine, the Archbishop of the Greek Orthodox Church, and then the, uh, you know, uh, you know, Rabbi, and then the mother, we came together for an ecumenical uh, or interfaith service. Praying together. Beautiful. This is, if, for the people who have read John 17, this is what our Lord wants. I'm just saying that. I'm just putting that out there. Excellent, Father. Um, my, my question is for, for, your own, uh, for your own study. How do you study? Like, do you do you uh, block a time in your schedule to read a book? Do you listen to people? How do you schedule your study? Well, uh, when I travel, you know, that's when I read books. And then sometimes if I have to lecture on a topic, then, you know, I, you know, start reading. But otherwise, uh, you know, unfortunately now that I, you know, uh, you know, I have been, uh, you know, in, in the U.S. and also here in Europe uh, busy, uh, I don't devote too much time on academics and so far. But then again, every uh, uh, experience is also learning, like, you know, meeting with people, attending conferences, you know, uh, you know, this is all learning. Uh, you know, every, uh, you know, again, uh, sometimes I say, I say that I learn more about God when I learn more about people. That's a beautiful statement. I learn more about God when I learn more about people. I have to write this, that one down. Yeah. This is my, this is my, again, human experience, because again, you know, knowing people, because, you know, we are human beings and then we have our uh, sometimes issues, pains or whatever, because this is for us. Uh, when you know more about it, uh, you know, all that, then you understand God's love, why he sent his only begotten son. Uh, and for me, it's very important to continue loving people without discrimination. Yeah, absolutely. But are there any, do we have a, a, a patron saint? For instance, my, my patron saint... For now, Saint Paul. <laughs> well, definitely, yeah, I, Saint Paul. Yeah, no, you know, I agree. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it's, go ahead. No, he, I mean, he is the one who brought Christian faith to the pagan world, because again, he knew, he understood. You know, in his studies, he's called in Armenian the uh, 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 the apostle of the pagans. Etanosats Arakyan. Etanosats, yeah, yeah. Etanosats Arakyan. Mm. I mean, he's the one who brought Christian faith to Europe, to Rome, which was the center. Rome at that time was the center of everything, politically, you know, in learning, in everything, you know. Rome was the center because he 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 understood 
he understood. And that's why I was telling, you know, coming back, it's very important for a priest to understand his people. Exactly. Yeah. Paul understood his uh, his audience. Yeah. No, no, I, you know, I agree. I mean, St. Paul is also is my favorite apostle, def definitely. But then again, among the Armenian saints, of course, uh, St. Gregory at Shunorali. Hmm. I mean, he was a great leader in every aspect. Hmm. And uh, despite Paul and uh, Shunorali, is there other, other non-Armenian saint that is after your heart? Ephraim. Ephraim? Ephraim the Syrian. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So deep. <laughs> I have I have his work, but I still have to find time myself to to read all that. So, yeah, so I deep. Will, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Um, for the people who are uh, Father, uh, I hope you find it find this well. Uh, there are people who are watching this uh, live as as well. Uh, would you like to answer some questions in the live chat? Maybe perhaps the people in the chat could have some questions for you if sure, you want. Sure. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. If I'm people, able. <laughs> Absolutely. Guys, if you have some questions or remark for uh, um, Archbishop Khazak Barsian, please put it in a chat and then um, we can ask him as well. It has been so far. Thank you very much, Khazak Barsian. It has been an absolute blessing. Uh, I have been very looking for this interview for a very long time. Do you guys have any questions? Drop it in the chat and I will... Uh, take a couple of them and then we're going to end this interview are there before we do this are there other things you want to get leave us with is there any type of wisdom or things you want to leave us uh, for all those who are watching yeah well my prayer is that uh, you know we uh, always open our hearts you know uh, you know, sometime in our lives, you know, we face challenges, difficulties, or people, they hurt us. Uh, but, you know, in front of such, you know, things, it's very important that we uh, leave our hearts open and never stop loving and caring. Because, you. Uh, you know, I always say, Hatred is the worst enemy of a person. And hatred is the worst enemy of a nation. Because if I hate someone, it's a big burden on my shoulders, on my heart. I feel that burden, not the person whom I hate. It's terrible feeling. So again, my prayer is that, you know, you know, younger generation will not feel that kind of hatred in their hearts, even though those individuals who hurt them or, uh, you know, situations, be, you know, your heart's always open because this is how really you enjoy life. Mm -hmm. Or rather than you feel that you are in peace because this is what we are searching in our lives to feel in peace, to be, bring balance in our lives. So I pray for that. Thank you. Thank you. Much needed for everybody. So thank you very much, Father. It means a lot for me as well. Uh, so we have here a question. I'm going to put it out here. It's by a rogue disciple. She says, Sarpazan Hair, Merci Shatz. Uh, do you see Armenian monasticism returning to a uh, Hyrenik and perhaps outside of it, such as the U.S., Astvats Oknakan? Astvats Bahaban. Well, monasticism is very important. Again, we were talking about uh, like Krikor uh, Naregatsi and, uh, you know, Nerses Shunorali. I mean, these are the figures uh, who created uh, so-called the spiritual treasures of the Armenian church in a monastic situation. Monasticism is, is very important, especially in the Orthodox church, in the Eastern churches, monasticism is very important. 
you know, unfortunately, during the genocide and also uh, during Soviet, uh, you know, Armenia, all the monastics, uh, monastics uh, you know, they were all destroyed. And now that there is a possibility, uh, it is coming back, but slowly. Like, I am very happy that near Ashtarak, now there is a, a group of nuns, if I am not mistaken, about 12, 10 nuns, you know, I visited with Vehapar, and, uh, you know, they pray together, they are very spiritual, uh, and also I know some people and some clergy who want to start the monastic movement, and I know that Vehapar also wants, uh, and in U.S. also we thought starting a also monastic movement, in fact, next to St. Nurses Seminary, there is a property, and, uh, you know, we were thinking about starting a monastic movement. And I hope that it will be achieved, uh, because uh, I am sure there will be people, men and women, uh, who will enter into that order, uh, and it will be very, very beneficial uh, for the people, for the Armenian people in many ways. I want I want to see that happen uh, in in your lifetime uh, as well, obviously, but also mine. That would be very much needed. That that would be a blissful. Uh, like for instance, uh, right next to Almelo, where we have our Armenian church, there's a city called Enschede. Yes. And there, uh, the the Syriac Orthodox, they have their the the Saint Ephraim yes. uh, monastery. And I'm very jealous of them. Jealous in a, in a good way, obviously. I was like, only if we Armenians in Holland or in Europe or outside would have such a monastery. That would bless my heart if I would see that. No, no, no. I know that monastery, and I know the Metropolitan, who is a good friend of mine, and uh, the, the Coptic Orthodox Church, Syriac Orthodox Church. They have several monasteries. Like in Germany, I have been in a Syriac Orthodox monastery, as well as the Coptic Orthodox monastery. Like last year I was in Egypt, you know, we had our uh, ecumenical uh, dialogue with the Catholic Church in a monastery in the desert. It's amazing to see uh, how the monasticism is, you know, flourishing in the Coptic Orthodox Church. And that's why you see how pious are the Coptic Orthodox are. So monasticism is very important is very important maybe we will uh, start monasticism in uh, uh, in the netherlands why not <laughs> why not i i hope that the lord knows my heart i hope that um i can help to open at least three churches in uh, in holland i want to see that happen i heard Tertarun say that around near rotterdam where, where i live that there we we're going to open a church yes as, as sukamkov i hope so are you, are you, i know with their daron, we were there. We met, you know, some people. Uh, okay, okay, do we have, are there any plans for in the future? Or do you want to? Uh... No, no, no. We are also thinking to build a Armenian church in Amsterdam, near Amsterdam, because the church, you know, which exists, definitely should stay, uh, should stay there. But then it's not enough. Uh, yeah. There is a large community of the Armenians in and around Amsterdam, so. There should be an Armenian structured church with a church hall, with the parking, uh, with the hall where young people can come, like Sunday school, youth activities, like, you know, like in Almolo, for example. Uh, and I know that the parish council and their hire, we have spoken about it, you know, that, you know there is that vision. And uh, I am sure that vision will be achieved. That, that makes me put a smile on my face. That would be amazing. Like we have uh, at our church in Amsterdam, currently the Surpoki uh, church in Amsterdam, which means Holy Spirit, by the way, for those who don't know. We have a good problem. It's very, very packed. <laughs> like people really have to wait outside for the liturgy, like have to look into the, the windows to see the liturgy happen. So it's a good problem to have. No, 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 no. It's a very active community. There is no question, but then you know, imagine that it's in a place where people can drive, can come uh, yeah. with the children and everything. It will be even triple, four times. Uh, like, you know, Almolo, you know, every Sunday is packed, you know, the church. Or Easter Sunday, when I come and we celebrate in a, a Catholic church, uh, more than 1,000 people come. 
because you know it's a big you know uh, huge church <laughs> yeah makes me very happy i have here another question uh, let me just see here it's from uh, many the question is how does father Khajak, from an armenian orthodox perspective view churches changing their liturgical language to modern ones to attract more congregants interesting question that's a that's a good <laughs> that's a good question this is something which has been uh, you know discussed and still being discussed like in the us you know uh, i gave a permission for a, a priest to have uh, experimental badarak uh, where uh, the, you know uh, he says the words in uh, english and then singing in armenian and the church was packed Uh, but then, like in the U.S., uh, uh, we, uh, depending of the community, that like, you know, Havadam, the creed is recited by the entire com congregation in English. The uh, Hostovanang, uh, the, uh, you know, the confession is done uh, in English. Uh, the sermon, both languages, uh, sometime only uh, like few minutes, depending of the community, there are some communities where uh, people they don't speak Armenian, only few words. So uh, there, you know, you speak only e English. So and also the readings, like uh, it is being done also in Amsterdam, the readings from uh, the New Testament they are done in in English. Uh, it is a challenge. It's a challenge, and I hope that the bishops' conference will consider this because there it's a. Uh, there are some so-called traditionals who say that, you know, if we change the language, then we will lose our language. But then again, uh, there is Greek experience, there is Syriac experience, there is also uh, Coptic experience. We don't need to be afraid. Absolutely. It, it's yeah. a challenge. It's a challenge. It's a challenge and it's being, you know, spoken. And I think people should speak about it continue speaking about it because this is for the benefit of the church and i am sure god will lead us to find the best solution absolutely yeah he will open doors for us absolutely thank you many that was a good question i have here another question for you father uh, by optimistic one the question is is too much to hope for an armenian right in the catholic church is there currently dialogue discussing full communion yes i mean uh, this you know we have this dialogue this past 20 years theological dialogue where again uh, all the facts of the church you know ecclesiology christology liturgy you know all those things are being you know discussed by the scholars on both sides, Oriental Orthodox and Catholic. Uh, and then the uh, intent is, you know, how to bring communion. But then in a way that uh, uh, there will not be only one head, like the Pope. Because like in Oriental Orthodox churches, there are seven patriarchs or Catholicoi. They are in communion, but there is no one head. So, there is no need to have one head to create communion. Already some Catholic theologians also are in agreement. In fact, Pope himself, on two occasions, once in Armenia, in Echmiazin, on, on the altar, you know, uh, he said, unity when there is no one higher than the other. And he said the same thing also in uh, Constantinople, in Istanbul, at the Greek Orthodox Patriarchy. Mm. Interesting statement. Beautiful. Excellent answer. Father, um, I don't see any other questions here. So I'm going to um, close this one off. It take me. It will take me quite a while to tell you how, how grateful I am for, for you, first of all, for your work, for the work that you already have been doing. Uh, God knows... How, what type of effect it has brought into the world. We, we cannot see it now, but he sees exactly what is happening. Um, you really are um, an example for all of us. 
that's that's obviously a lot of people will will follow in your footsteps as well i want to thank you very much for what you have done for not only our church but obviously for other churches um yeah my sincere gratitude i thank god for for you thank you very much well i i thank you vartan for creating this you know opportunity to have a uh, you know dialogue and also you know very soon there will be vartanas day the feast of saint vartan so i congratulate your name and uh, uh, and definitely vartan is a great example for us to follow especially in this uh, era where there are so many challenges vis-a-vis -vis to our faith you know the partan and his followers 451 when persians they wanted armenians to leave their christian faith uh, and uh, uh, wor worship the fire zoroastrianism they said no power in the world can separate us from our faith our faith is like our skin uh, and they died for their faith but then they didn't you know, live their faith. So, uh, Vartan is a great example for us to be faithful to our roots, who we are. And my congratulations to you. May Vartan's spirit guide you, inspire you, and all the younger generation of Armenians and everyone, not only Armenians. Again, Vartan is a good example for all, uh, you know, people of faith that they remain very steadfast of their faith in spite the challenges in the uh, you know society you know again you know we all pray for the peace in the world especially now that we see many terrible things are happening it's you know people innocent people you know are dying or innocent people are being thrown away from their ancestral homeland so these are all uh, challenges in the society and we pray for the wisdom of the leadership, uh, you know, political leadership. And uh, we pray that there is a balance in the world because, uh, unfortunately, presently there is no balance. There are two extremes. There are two extremes in the world. So we pray for the balance so that through that balance approach, there will be peace in the world. We pray for that. We pray for peace in the world. Thank you, Father. Everybody, thank you all for being here. I'm going to close this close this out. See you all the next time. Khajak Sarpazan. Aswaz Oknakan Sarpazan Heir. Aswaz Baban. Aswaz Baban. May God protect all of you. Thank you.